a few thoughts on, on how peacekeeping came to be, uh, and, and second, uh, what are the key principles at the core of, of peacekeeping operations? Well, peacekeeping started really as an enterprise to regulate relations between states, not within states. Mm -hmm. Actually, the word peacekeeping cannot be found in the Charter of the United Nations. Uh, peacekeeping uh, started as an effort to monitor ceasefires, deploying uh, military observers to make sure that agreements to end the war were respected. And then it uh, grew into something more ambitious. Uh, and the real turning point was the end of the Cold War. In the 90s. The 90s. Uh, when then, uh, after the end of the Cold War, you had more internal conflicts, more civil wars. And there was also uh, less div divisions in the Security Council. And that led to a number of peacekeeping operations whose goal uh, is really to help a country that has been broken by civil war come together again. So a much more ambitious and complex, uh, and complex uh, enterprise uh, than was uh, envisaged in the early years uh, of the United Nations. So, so from the 1950s, I guess, all the way to the late uh, 1980s, it was quite simple and, and straightforward. Well, there were some, there was, uh, there were some big exceptions. Uh, mm -hmm. There was the first operation in uh, Congo, when uh, the, Congo, the, uh, the, the, the Belgian Congo became uh, independent. Yes. Uh, there was uh, a civil war. Uh, there, the possibility that Katonga would uh, secede, mm -hmm. uh, and the the state, uh, the new state was extremely weak, and the United Nations was called upon to uh, prevent uh, the breakup mm -hmm. of uh, Congo. Uh, this was a major operation. Uh, there were even jet fighters. Uh, really? in that operation, Swedish uh, fi uh, jet fighters. Because that, at the time, the, the Secretary General was from Sweden. Yes, yes. Uh, it was Dagger Marshall, and he yes. died uh, yes. while uh, in mission, on a mission uh, in uh, Congo. Uh, so that was the only big, uh, actually huge, uh, operation during the, the Cold War period. All the other operations, uh, there were, first there were very few of them yes. because it was hard to get the Security Council to agree uh, on anything. So there was the mission to uh, monitor the ceasefire between uh, Israel and its uh, Arab neighbors. Uh, there was the mission to monitor the ceasefire between uh, uh, India and Pakistan. Uh, these were the first two missions, actually, uh, two, the first two peacekeeping missions. Uh, the, the one in the Middle East was expanded uh, after the uh, Suez uh, crisis. For the first time, there were not only military observers, but troops mm -hmm. deployed. Then the Congo operation, the big, exe the big, big exception. The big exception. Uh, then you have uh, an operation like uh, you have Cyprus, mm -hmm. uh, where, I mean, with a, a war that uh, pits uh, I mean, the Turkish uh, troops and the Turkish Cypriots against mm -hmm. the, the, the Greek uh, Cypriots. But again, it's the monitoring of a ceasefire. And there is Lebanon uh, with uh, ceasefire, uh, again, uh, between uh, Israel uh, and, and Lebanon. And yeah. then there is the Golan yeah. that is between Syria and Israel. So all these operations are what we would call first-generation operation, traditional interstate uh, but, operations. But in a way, they are still going on, a number of them. They are Isn't it paradoxical? Well, you know, sometimes people ask, uh, so shouldn't we just pull out? Uh, my answer to, to that is to say um, even a frozen conflict, as they are called, is much better than a hot war. Yes. And the cost of any war, the human cost, uh, and also the financial cost, but the human cost, mm -hmm. is immense. And so the, 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 in reality, rather limited cost uh, of those uh, operations, of those so-called traditional operations, is well worth uh, the human lives uh, saved. And, and why is it that after all these decades, these uh, operations which you mentioned in, in India, in the, in the Middle East, in Cyprus and so on, haven't really led to uh, a settlement of the problem because the, the political dimension of the conflict hasn't really been... Uh... You know, the, these operations, they are there to prevent uh, resumption of war through an accident, uh, 
surprise and yeah. uh, an unforeseen chain of events. Mm -hmm. They do not claim to address the fundamentals of the conflict. In the case of Israel and, uh, for instance, Syria, and Syria uh, there is a territorial dispute uh, on the Golan. The operation has no ambition uh, to, uh, to solve that. And so that refers to much bigger issues yes. uh, in the Middle East. In the case of India, Pakistan, the dispute over Kashmir uh, goes to, to the heart of the, I mean, the identities of the, of the, two, of the two countries. But, so, but does it mean that the separations which are of the first generation and which are quite traditional are going to be with us forever? I hope not. I mean, there have been attempts, for instance, for Cyprus. Uh, there was a major effort uh, I mean, uh, at the initiative of uh, Kofi Annan to line, which has been pursued by uh, uh, Ban Ki-moon, uh, to get into a political process that would bring together the uh, Turkish Cypriot and the government of uh, Cyprus uh, and find a, a solution. It hasn't been found, but I do hope at some point it, it will be. And, and, and what made the, the first uh, UN involvement in Congo so special? Uh, because we're trying to... What made it an, expe an exception? Well, uh, Congo, I, I think when, uh, when the independence of Congo was proclaimed, uh, it immediately became apparent that there was really uh, very little uh, capacity. And so Congo was immediately torn by conflicting interests. You had the uh, Western Congo I mean, was, as it is today, a major producer of a number of uh, key minerals. Mm -hmm. Uh, this was the Cold War. There was a great uh, concern among Western countries that Congo could become, uh, I mean, uh, could join the Soviet, uh, the Soviet bloc. Uh, the position of Jagger Marshall was to try to avoid that Congo become uh, a pawn in that East-West, uh, in that East-West confrontation. But the stakes were very high, considering the uh, the enormous mineral resources of Congo, the extreme weakness uh, of the state, yes. and so the games being played by various power, including the fact that the uh, secession of Katanga had uh, support among some uh, Western countries, and for the UN, I mean, this is an episode when you when you go to Congo uh, today, you you still uh, sense. Uh, there are mi very mixed feelings about on that, what happened, about what happened yes. there, because you, you remember the assassination yes. of, uh, of Lumumba, yes. uh, which is uh, a key moment uh, in the history of, uh, of modern uh, Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, the UN could not uh, prevent it. Yes, uh, and, and so by association, uh, the UN, uh, this operation was a bit uh, tarnished, although you, the, there was nothing the UN really could, could, could have done. Mm -hmm. So all the way to the late 80s, uh, the principles at the core of peace operations are interposition and ceasefire. That's basically yes, the uh, idea. That's basically the idea, and from, from uh, you know, the nature of that operation emerge a few key principles in the, the way peacekeeping operations are conducted. Impartiality. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're monitoring a ceasefire, you're not on one side or another. Uh, use of force only in, uh, in self-defense. Uh, yeah. uh, you're not there to conduct offensive operations. Uh, and consent of the parties, yeah. because you, you are there to, to implement an agreement between parties. You are not there to enforce something that the parties mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't want. But as you mentioned, things uh, changed dramatically in the 90s. So how, do, how would you summarize these dramatic changes in the 90s which preceded the time when you, mm -hmm. when you arrived? Well, the dramatic change is that more and more you have civil wars. Mm -hmm. uh, Yugoslavia is a civil war. Uh, Sierra Leone will be a, a civil war. The, new, the second uh, Congo operation is about a, a major uh, civil war involving a variety of countries. So uh, civil war, that's the first change, and, and as a consequence of that change, uh, the central role of non-state actors, yes. uh, which 
we change this in a, in a rather fundamental way, uh, the, the nature of peace operations, because state actors, they have their international standing to protect. Uh, they are accountant, as members of the United Nations, they have a certain status uh, to, to, to respect. Uh, Non-state actors, I would say, they have la much less uh, political capital, so to speak, uh, at stake. So the agreements uh, that uh, the United Nations is called upon to implement are very different very from, different. The, from the first generation, so to speak, ag of agreements. Yeah. First, because the parties to the agreement, they may um, actually go back on their word so uh, you cannot trust them? Uh, so you, you, yes, you cannot really trust them. You have to raise the stakes in some, to, to raise the price uh, for them to, um, to, to break uh, an, an agreement. Uh, that's the first and major difference. Uh, a second uh, difference is that uh, these agreements, they often outline a political process leading to the emergence of a new of new legitimate uh, authorities, elections, uh, uh, transitional administration, a whole series of very complex steps mm -hmm. which, are, uh, which raises a whole range of issues which go way beyond the traditional monitoring of a ceasefire. And I would say uh, th also, thirdly, that uh, the, the parties, because they often are not state actors, and because of the very nature of those conflicts, the civilian population, instead of being a, a spectator uh, in the conflict uh, with professional armies uh, really at the heart of the conflict, now this, the population becomes both an actor and a target, and a target yes. of the conflict. Uh, and so you, that's why the notion of protection of civilians mm -hmm. is going to appear, because these new conflicts, they're not about control of territory, mm -hmm. they are about control of people. Uh, and that uh, leads to a level of uh, violence and suffering mm -hmm. uh, that is unprecedented. When you think of um, in the immense tragedies in, Yugos in Yugoslavia, in Rwanda, the, 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 the major crises of the, and tragedies of the 90s, you, you are in a world very different. Uh, from the world of the 50s uh, and absolutely. 60s. Absolutely. When you think about uh, the 90s and peacekeeping operations, you have three issues uh, which somehow define uh, UN peacekeeping operations in the 90s. Uh, humanitarian issues, including humanitarian interventions, use of force, and um, I forgot the third one, but I mean, chapter uh, peacemaking. Peace so these yeah. are really, I think, some of the characteristics which... Uh, uh, which are the core of, of, of peacekeeping in the 90s, right? Yes, I mean, the peacekeeping in uh, Yugoslavia starts as a humanitarian yes. enterprise. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say, I mean, I can say it because I was not involved in it, that in all fairness to the United Nations, actually, uh, the UNPROFOR, that was the name of the mission in Yugoslavia, with all its failings, uh, certainly limited the number of uh, victims uh, of the war. People were fed who would have died of uh, hunger otherwise. That being said, I think the concept that was pushed by the Security Council was fundamentally flawed uh, because it looked at the consequences of the conflict and not at the causes. It didn't look at the, the, it didn't make a real political analysis of, of the conflict, and uh, so tried just to, to, to minimize the consequences. And there was no solution until the, the real politics of the conflict led to a coherent strategy. Uh, 94, 95. Yes. yes, yes. So you, you step in in 2000. So what kind of situation do you, do you find when you start uh, uh, heading uh, UN peacekeeping operations in 2000? I mean, uh, what is the state of peacekeeping? Well, at the time? you see, it's, it's very interesting to see how peacekeeping since the end of the Cold War goes in cycles. Yes. Uh, when uh, the Berlin Wall falls, there is an enormous optimism in the Security Council that now there's going to be a possibility to do real business because there is no more the east-west divide. And so you have an explosion of peacekeeping, a rapid boom, with a number of operations that are forgotten today, but they are forgotten because they were successful. 
uh, when you think of Cambodia, when you think of Namibia, when you think of uh, Salvador, when you think of Mozambique, these are all successful operations. All those countries, they may not be perfect, but they are in a state of peace, which is the, the goal of a peacekeeping operation. So you have this optimism, optimism that leads to a sort of overreach, and that's the Yugoslav operation, uh, followed by uh, Somalia, followed by Rwanda. Three, three tragedies. And so by the middle of the 90s, uh, a complete loss of confidence in what peacekeeping can achieve. And after a rapid... So we forgot about the successes and yes. we focused on the failures. And uh, uh, by 1995, there is a sense that UN peacekeeping is essentially over. Uh, that it, uh, if there are peace operations in the future, they might be done by regional organization, by NATO, but UN, it's finished. And so you have a rapid uh, decline in the number of peacekeepers. Very, I mean, uh, very rapid decline. And... Uh, by 1998, yes, no, no sense that peacekeeping is uh, in the UN is important. And then 1999 happens. Uh, Kosovo. Uh, and then you have Kosovo, you have Timor, and you have Democratic Republic of Congo. And in those three cases, the international community, surprisingly, but in hindsight for a very good reason, turns to the UN. It turns to the UN for two reasons. One, a reason of legitimacy. In a, on a question as sensitive as Kosovo. It's so important after the division in the UN. Remember, the war in Kosovo happens without the authorization of the Council, of the Security Council, mm -hmm. because uh, Russia, Russia mm -hmm. uh, is, is opposed uh, to it. And everybody understands that this is a very dangerous situation, that the international community needs to come together. How can it come together? There is no alternative to the UN. And that's uh, the origin of the UN mission in, in Kosovo. Kosovo. Timor, uh, Congo, uh, there is the question of legitimacy because uh, as uh, Timor uh, uh, moves toward, uh, I mean, uh, secedes uh, from, I mean, uh, from uh, Indonesia. In Indonesia, the occupation of Indonesia is, I mean, is terminated uh, and Timor asserts it, its rights. Uh, you need uh, a legitimizing uh, process, a legitimizing institution, no alternative to the United Nations. At Congo, Sierra Leone, there is an issue of fourth generation. Mm -hmm. That is, the UN has, a, has the other fundamental comparative advantage of the United Nations uh, with, uh, after the, the, its, legitim its legitimacy mm -hmm. is the, capacity, the, the fact that there, it has the capacity to recruit troops worldwide and no other organization can do that. Can do that. Yes. Uh, and so when the international community looks at ways to address those two evolving crises uh, in Timor and, and, in, and in Congo, it finds that it has to turn to the UN. And so when I arrive in 2000, there is, um, we are just at the beginning of, of a new, new expansion, uh, yes. uh, and we are also at the beginning of a new phase of peacekeeping, because there have been those devastating disasters of the 90s. The UN has been more transparent about the disasters than probably any organization uh, would have been, and certainly any national government. Uh, it published a very uh, hard-hitting report on Srebrenica. Mm -hmm. It published another hard-hitting report Rwanda. on Rwanda. And drawing on the broader lessons of the decade, it asked uh, the former foreign minister of Algeria, Lagda Brahimi, with a blue ribbon uh, panel, uh, to uh, reflect on what peacekeeping should be. And that's the report, so-called Brahimi report, that is issued in the summer of 2000, uh, which really becomes for me the roadmap yes. uh, on how one should strengthen uh, peacekeeping and which defines, I would say, a, a new phase, uh, a new generation of peacekeeping And, and so part of your job as you start uh, in this position is to implement uh, this roadmap coming from the Brahimi report. Absolutely. And, and what are the main aspects of this, uh, of this roadmap? Uh, in the Brahimi report, there are really uh, two sets of recommendations. Uh, there are recommendations which are addressed to the Security Council and to the member states. Mm -hmm. 
the, the, the report essentially says to the uh, Security Council and to the member states, peacekeeping is important, it's difficult, it's serious. If you care about it, be serious about it. Yeah. Uh, give it the right resources, uh, the military resources, uh, the material resources, the and the political, backing. and backing. the political, that's last but not least, yes. and the political uh, backing. Mm -hmm. And don't ask peacekeepers to do what they cannot do. That is, when you deploy a peacekeeping mission, make sure that the situation is amenable uh, to, uh, to peacekeeping, that, so, uh, that there, is, there is a political basis, that there is a, a peace to keep. So a form of realism applied to peacekeeping. Yes. So that's the first element. That's, that's the message for the Security Council, which is the organ that decides yes. uh, a peacekeeping operation, and for the member states, the, the, the whole, all the member states, because they are the ones who, who provide the troops. Uh, and then there is a message, I would say, for the Secretariat. Uh, which is, first, be honest with the member states. There is a famous sentence in the Brahimi report, tell the council uh, what it needs to know, not what it wants to hear, okay. uh, which is a very good uh, prescription. Not always easy uh, to implement, but I always kept that in the back of my Why mind. Why is it so difficult? Well, because you're under enormous uh, pressure, uh, because the Security Council is your boss. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the Security Council I mean, uh, wants uh, to control uh, the process. And so if you uh, tell uh, unpleasant truth, that complicates uh, the life of the Security Council. And some of the most powerful nations in the world are on the Security Council. And so they, they may create some difficulties for you. And you always have to, to, to walk a fine line between uh, being honest and at the same time not antagonizing your master yes. so much that then it will become dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a judgment call. So there is that uh, message to the Secretariat. And the other message to the Secretariat is, which, and also in a way to the member states, be, get professional. Uh, so What does it mean, get professional? Get professional, that is, uh, when you, run, when you uh, conduct military operations, men have a real headquarters, organize it in a professional way, I mean, uh, deploy uh, more effectively, uh, run peacekeeping as, not as a kind of exceptional activity of the UN, but as a core business of the UN, and so put in place effective structures Mechanism, to, to backstop so on, yes. procedures, yes. etc., to, to backstop operations, which in any case will be difficult, but at least they deserve uh, a solid structure because to support Because it was them. not the case in the 90s. So in the 90s, it was amazing. Uh, at the time of Yugoslavia, there was not even a situation room working 24, working around the clock. So you are in Yugoslavia, you want to call uh, the UN. What is, yeah. uh, if it's not office hours, you have a problem. Uh, of course, now that is completely uh, changed. I mean, uh, peacekeeping in 2011 uh, has not, very little in common. Uh, with uh, peacekeeping in 1993, and, and so, so you, you you begin to implement this uh, this roadmap. I mean, uh, well, the the challenge there. I mean, implementing that roadmap. What does it mean? There is a political dimension. Yes. That is a certain attitude, I would say, vis-à-vis -vis the council, and then there is all the practicalities of it. That is to build a consensus among uh, member states, uh, so that they will, because you need budgets, you need people. Uh, uh, so that they will support that transformation of the instrument. And that's... Uh, that's the a huge amount of diplomatic work to be done. Yes, yes, because uh, after the uh, tragedies of the 90s, where, I mean, and in the 90s there were a number of troops from Western countries, uh, essentially the Western countries decided to leave yes. uh, UN peacekeeping. And so now you have a situation where they sense that the mandates are going to be more difficult, uh, already, I mean, uh, Congo doesn't look easy, <laughs> uh, even in, uh, in 99 mm -hmm. to, to 2000. Uh, but the troops that are, called, that are deployed to implement those mandates in Sierra Leone, in Congo, they are troops from the developing world. So they are as professional as you would want them to be? Well, some are very professional, but there is a certain degree of resentment uh, that uh, the countries that decide 
uh, who will take the risk do not put their troops at risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you want to reform peacekeeping, uh, you want to have an agreement between the countries that decide, essentially the, the members of the council, the countries that pay the bill, yes. uh, that is essentially the rich uh, countries, and the countries that take the risk, essentially the countries from the non-aligned movement, from uh, the developing world. And one of my uh, priorities uh, during all those years in peacekeeping was to, to bring together those three group of countries. But saying you, It was a challenge, but uh, I really enjoyed it because uh, I thought you could build common ground because the, the countries that deploy the troops, they have a real interest in their troops not being unnecessary at risk. So they do have an interest in professional, uh, in a professionalization of peacekeeping. The countries that pay the bill, they want their money to be well spent. So they also have an interest in professionalization. And the countries that decide, which overlap in large measure with the countries that pay the bill, but not completely, when uh, Japan and uh, Germany are not permanent members of the Council, uh, the countries that decide, well, when they decide, they want success. They, they want don't success. want failure. Yes. So you, you do have a certain convergence if you play it right. Yeah. And, and, and do you feel that it worked over the years? Uh, over the years, it worked. I think the danger, frankly, is that as peacekeeping was, I would say, stabilized, uh, as uh, more operations were deployed, and it seemed to be, I mean, there were setbacks, but on the whole, there was a sense that peacekeeping was doing better than in the 90s, then the ambitions grew even faster than the instruments. Mm. And uh, my concern, frankly, today is that I think, again, in a way, the international community is ahead of what the instrument uh, can, can so do. So we, we are asking too much. We are asking too much, yes. yes. But the, the, the nature of, of UN peacekeeping operations, the 2000s, changed a bit compared to the 90s. I mean, we didn't have this kind of uh, uh, humanitarian interventions which we had in the 90s. So tell us a bit about the nature of peacekeeping in the, uh, in the 2000s. Well, I, there, I think there was a greater recognition that it's all about politics. And ah. I'm, myself, I insisted on that. Because, uh, and still today, I think uh, that message must not be lost. And it's, it's always at risk, that message. For instance, today there is a great emphasis put on protection of civilians. Yes. Uh, and rightly so, because if the UN is not about protecting uh, people, if it's not about the people. I mean, the, the yes. charter, the first word of the charter are we the people. Uh, so that's really the, 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 the fundamental uh, role of the UN, is to make people live a better life. So protection of civilians, in a way, is at the heart of what the UN does. At the same time, it is sometimes seen more as a kind of a technical uh, effort, uh, while in reality, uh, lasting protection of civilians is about building accountable political institutions. Yes. Uh, because so that's the, what you mean by it's all about politics. It's all about politics. It's all about making sure that you have uh, the various stakeholders in a, in a conflict have come to some kind of common ground, that they have a stake in the agreement that they have signed, and that you have a process in place that will gradually, I would say, shift power from the bullet to the ballot, uh, to put it... Yeah. Uh, and so that's why uh, throughout the, nine, the 2000s, it seems to me, you insisted on the importance of, the, of, of dovetailing properly peacekeeping and, and peace building. I think it was an important part of your agenda. Absolutely, because if you address only the symptoms, the violence, you know, you deploy peacekeepers, you deploy blue helmets, I mean, you, you do hope that they're going to lower the temperature, that they're going to bring a measure of security. Sometimes the, the challenge are so immense that uh, they don't do it as, uh, as we would like them to do. But most of the time, there is an improvement in the security uh, situation. Uh, but that improvement will be short-lived uh, if, if it is not backed by, by capacity-building institutions, institution uh, building so that uh, the people, uh, you rebuild the, the social capital, I would say, uh, in the country that has been devastated. But if you, if you, if you, so this requires, I guess, I mean, dovetailing properly, peacekeeping and peace building requires somehow creating partnership, uh, partnerships within the UN uh, or the international system between the UN and the World Bank. I mean, uh, yes. 
so it, it, it's, also, it's not an easy task. It's an immensely difficult task because in all those operations, the, the key is orchestration. Uh, you are foreigners in a country uh, that you don't really know. Uh, your future is not the future of the people of the country, and you are trying to influence in a positive way that future. You have some leverage, the troops, the money that you are prepared to spend, the, the good advice that you are in a position to give if you get the right people. Uh, but all that has to be really organized around a, a coherent strategy that supports what the people of the country want. Uh, because if there's no, if there's no national leadership, I mean, it's not what the foreigners decide that will stick. Uh, you, you have to be humble. You have to know that this is not your country, this is not your future, and so you, you really have to be a, a good listener. But then when you translate that general principle of orchestration, of having a coherent strategy into practical prescription, it's immensely difficult because you, you have to orchestrate the UN system. Yes, which is, uh, uh, and the UN system in many cases represents just a fraction of the money spent on the, on the country. Uh, but orchestrating that system Reconciling, I would say, the logic, the political logic of peacekeeping with the longer-term logic of development, development uh, recognizing that the specificity that uh, a post-conflict country has really specific challenges, all that is hard. Uh, reconciling, I would say, the development logic, the humanitarian logic, and the peace and the peacekeeping logic. The peacekeeping logic is political. The development logic is long-term, and the humanitarian logic is about substitution, Im emergency. And in reality, so you have different temporalities. You have, you have different temporalities, different priorities. Uh, myself, because I'm a peacekeeper, I like to quote Keynes that uh, in the long term we're all dead. And so, uh, in the in a post-conflict situation, in a country emerging from conflict, if you if you ignore the short term, uh, you're not going to get the long term right because the country is just going to relapse into conflict. So I think the political agenda, no matter what, has to be absolutely uh, of paramount uh, importance. And you cannot do development as usual uh, in a post-conflict country as you would do in a stabilized country. Another big difference is that you uh, uh, I forgot what I had to say. <laughs> uh, no, another... Uh, you will cut that. No, no. Um, another big... Uh, sorry. <laughs> no, I, I was to going say. to ask you, uh, and, and we'll come back to this other big difference, I'm sure that you're going to mm -hmm. uh, remember. Yeah, I know what I don't. Yeah, no, the, another, another big difference is that in a stable country, you are, I mean, if let's say there is a UNDP office, you are supporting an existing legitimate government. And uh, a key element of your task is just to make that government happy. Yes. Uh, in a, a post-conflict country, it's a much more complex game because you, you have to, uh, to push Find your harder. Way in between, uh... Uh, you, have some, you have to show more independence uh, because the institutions, the national interlocutors, are in a state of flux. Yes. And what you are promoting is a rearrangement of the relationship between the key actors. So you, you have to have a much more active uh, political role. So reconciling the, the, I would say, the development culture with the peacekeeping culture is not self-evident. Nor is reconciling the uh, humanitarian culture with the peacekeeping culture. Because humanitarian culture is essentially about, I mean, it's needs-driven, uh, just help people in desperate need. Uh, and that's a very important thing to do. But if you want to prevent the resumption of conflict, you have to shift to uh, really building the capacities uh, of the country you want to have. Think of uh, South Sudan, uh, now very much in the news with the uh, income, with the independence of uh, South Sudan. Uh, during many years, when there was a war between South Sudan and uh, Khartoum, there was a major uh, humanitarian operation there, which was called Operation Lifeline uh, Sudan. Uh, and its role was, yes, to keep 
the, the people of South Sudan alive, but by feeding them, by giving them the, the uh, support that they de so desperately needed. And that, that operation was uh, an admirable uh, success, I think. But now the challenge is very different. Uh, now it's about building, uh, helping a country build itself. Yes. Uh, so now it's about making sure that there's a functioning Ministry of Finance, functioning Ministry of Agriculture, and that goal can become, in a way, antagonistic to the, to the humanitarian goal because uh, you want the country to take charge. Uh, you, do, you want the country to take full ownership. And so it's there also it's an important uh, shift that you have to operate. And, and so all of these uh, challenges and dilemmas that you had to, to deal with, you encountered them in the context of uh, uh, what kind of crisis? I mean, what are the main cases with which you had to deal with uh, throughout the, the 2000s? There were, there were many, <laughs> too many. Yes. Uh, one of the most difficult was, uh, and still is, uh, the Democratic Republic of, uh, of the Congo. Oh, so why is it so difficult? Well, it's difficult because it's a country of 60, uh, 60 million uh, people. It's a huge country. It's a huge country. It's about the size of Western uh, Europe, but it's a Western Europe that would have had no freeways, no, uh, no solid infrastructure. Uh, so it's a very fragmented country, which doesn't mean that there is not a national identity in Congo. I think there is one, mm -hmm. and people who talk about the... Uh, break up of the country, I think, don't understand uh, Congo. There's a s strong feeling of being Congolese and, uh, and a legitimate pride of being Congolese. But so the size of the country is a huge challenge. Another challenge is, that, is the, uh, uh, the terrible state of, uh, of, uh, structure, of institutional structures that is in the country. In the country. That is for during all the Mobutu years, there was not mm, and there was a, not a serious effort to build a, a well-functioning yes. uh, state. Uh, and the third, uh, a third challenge is uh, that Congo is very rich. It would look like an asset, but it's, a, it's in some ways a liability so because it, it creates a lot of appetites. Appetites, yes. Uh, appetites among rival Congolese and appetites among uh, I mean, the neighbors and the international community. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, in a way, brings the, the fourth uh, big uh, challenge, is that it's very hard to think of a peaceful Congo if you don't have a peaceful region, if region. you don't have uh, stabilized relations between uh, Kinshasa and Kigali, Kinshasa and Kampala, uh, Kinshasa and Bujumbura, Kinshasa and Luanda. You need, you need uh, between all those capitals... A lot of goodwill. A lot of goodwill and a sense of common purpose. And you need all the countries to be reconciled with the idea that uh, a strong Congo is in the best interest of the region. And, but that's not what the neighbors tend to think. That the neighbors tend not to think that a strong Congo is the way to go. They hesitate. They hesitate. <laughs> they hesitate, yes. They're not so sure. And, and so when, when, uh, when Congo landed on your desk, what was going to be the goal uh, of the mission? Uh, what was going to be uh, uh, the expected results? Well, when Congo landed on, an, uh, on my desk, actually the mission was launched even before I joined, uh, a few months before I joined. Uh, when, you, when you found Congo when on When I desk. found Congo on my desk, uh, it was, the mandate in a way was uh, still quite limited. Congo at the time was occupied by several uh, foreign armies because each side in the conflict, the uh, Kabila, I mean Laurent Désiré Kabila, Kabila Senior, the, the father of the present uh, president, mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and then the uh, rebels who were challenging uh, Laurent Désiré Kabila, they each had allies. Uh, and so you had many African armies in Congo. And you had a ceasefire line, which was not a ceasefire, um, a very clear ceasefire line, but you had essentially one part of Congo uh, occupied by, controlled uh, by rebels and uh, associated foreign armies. And you had another part of Congo uh, controlled by the government in Kinshasa and associated uh, armies. So the first uh, phase was 
uh, to ensure a withdrawal of those armies to neutralize these armies and a reunification yes. of Congo, of Congo. Uh, the withdrawal of armies was a had to be a military process with a series of agreement uh, the uh, reunification of Congo had to be a political uh, process and so th these two processes uh, were I mean uh, pushed and by 2003 uh, the armies were withdrawing uh, including the Ugandan army in 2003 but then a whole new set of problems appeared and that was probably the, the toughest crisis I had to face uh, during my eight years at the helm of peacekeeping it was in 2003 as uh, the Ugandan were withdrawing from Ituri which is in the northeastern uh, corner of the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, right next to uh, Uganda. Uh, very severe violence erupted in Ituri with the risk of uh, massive killing, killings. Uh, we had no troops uh, and, there. And, and massive killings mean tens of thousands? Yes, I mean, uh, that was the possibility, yes. frankly. Because in uh, Ituri you have uh, uh, deep ethnic uh, divides. Uh, between the Lendu and the Hema in particular. There are other uh, tribal groups which are actually very important to bring a measure of, I mean, uh, to, to help uh, avoid a total polarization like between the Hutu and the Tutsis in, in Rwanda. And it's very important for the stability of Ituri that there are also these uh, groups like the Alur and others. Uh, but uh, there was a risk of massive killings because these uh, tribal groups, they all had, uh, they were aligned with, the, they had friends uh, in, in the Congo, yes. in the neighborhood. Yes. And so the, the global conflict could turn into a very nasty tribal conflict. All that uh, further poisoned by the natural resources yes. that exist in Ituri. Major, one of the biggest gold mines in the world is in Ituri. So, enormous risk. And faced to that, a very weak mission, because that mission uh, was just about monitoring a ceasefire and withdrawal. It was uh, that, so it had, uh, it had a very limited number, it had about 5,000 troops, which is ridiculous when you think of the size of Congo. And those troops, their role was essentially to protect uh, bases where there were a few helicopters to, to monitor the, the ceasefire uh, line, nothing more than that. I had just one battalion in reserve uh, of Uruguayan, and uh, very courageously, those Uruguayans, uh, I mean, the president of Uruguay agreed to deploy that battalion uh, in, 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 in Ituri. But that battalion, so it deployed in the capital of Ituri, in Bunia, but it did not have the capacity to, uh, to really turn around the situation. The capacity it had, which was so important for the future, is that it focused the attention of the world on Ituri. And so then uh, uh, an effort began to mobilize a multinational force uh, and uh, Kofi Annan uh, and myself, we managed to convince uh, uh, my compatriots, the French, the French and the European Union, yes. to deploy a, a multinational force, uh, an EU force in Ituri. And then uh, the Security Council agreed to beef up, to strengthen uh, Munich. This was an enormous gamble because when, I, when the troops were deployed in Bunia, the, the Uruguayan troops, you know, uh, for the people there, they thought now they were saved. I knew they were not. So it could have turned into a Srebrenica. If the other mm. steps uh, haven't, hadn't been taken, uh, the people could have thought, oh, now we are saved by the UN, and then the UN would not have been in a position to really uh, save them. So there was a bit of a gamble that... Uh, this deployment would lead to, to more deployments, to, to a real strategic uh, shift. It works, but it gives you uh, an idea of the kind of ethical dilemmas you face, because the, the real dilemma was either you, you, know, you look the other way, because we were under no obligation in Ituri, because the, the mandate... There was no mandate. There was no mandate, because uh, the mandate says only, I mean, uh, you have to protect populations in imminent danger, but in the areas where you're deployed. So if you don't deploy, you don't have an obligation. If you deploy, you create an obligation for yes. yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I had this uh, tough choice to make between uh, uh, taking the risk of massive violence 
uh, and uh, having to live the rest of my life with the feeling I had, done, I had not done everything I could to prevent it, or taking the risk of a deployment that would not fundamentally change the situation, and that, if it was not then followed by more deployments, could lead to uh, a massacre in Bunia of all the people who hugged the UN base. I went there when the Uruguayans were there. It was a, it was a sad, it was really tragic. To, taking the risk that this deployment will not really transform the situation, will end up in failure, and then it would badly damage the instrument of peacekeeping because people would say, look, once again, the UN okay. in Bunia, like in Srebrenica, yeah. has let the people down. And, and there was no way for you to get uh, an additional mandate from the Security Council at the time. It is not about mandates, it's about resources. Resources. It's not at all about mandate. Uh, the issue was to get the resources, which, which is what happened. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and so uh, you, you got them. Yes, we yes. got the multinational force and we got the reinforcement of uh, Bonuk, and so that created a new dynamic, a new momentum, mm -hmm. and the operation was a success. Yeah, and since then... Uh, Monique, But, you know, when you make the initial decision, you don't know if all the, the next steps will work out the way you want them to work out. So you have to, you have to make a sort of judgment call. And, and, and gamble. And, and, and gamble. And since then, Monuk has been one of, if not the biggest. Uh, yes, the, it has been the, the biggest. And Monuk has had, uh, it has ebbed and flowed. So Bunia was a high point. Uh, then it slipped, uh, and there was a disaster in Bukavu, uh, in the Kivus, not in Ituri, where uh, the UN did not stand up to uh, a dangerous rebel, General Kunda. Uh, and, that, and then the UN lost all at once all the credibility it had gained in Bukavu. Mm. Uh, I, it was really a sad story, uh, and I think it could have been managed uh, differently. I was very unhappy with the way it was managed, but anyway. Uh, but then uh, the UN managed to claw back uh, credibility with operations that were conducted under I a mean, uh, Dutch uh, general that I appointed who was a military advisor in DPKO and, that I, and I asked him to go in Congo lead uh, an eastern division that would con uh, conduct uh, intensive operation and that rebuilt some credibility of the UN and then that gradually that credibility slipped again, again yes. uh, and uh, then there was I mean, uh, the failed operations of uh, uh, President Kabila, uh, it didn't work out against What you are telling us, in fact, it's, uh, it's that it's difficult to really have a long-term and sustained strategy if you, you never know exactly if you're going to have the appropriate resources. Yes, it is very difficult. And you, so the, you know, the art of peacekeeping is to have a very clear vision of where you want to go but know that there will be many twists and turns. Mm -hmm. uh, but at you the end, a strong stomach. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you also have to uh, uh, be aware that the UN, uh, without support of the member states, is going to be in a very it will always end up in a very difficult and, and, spot. And so all of this was happening at the time when the the geopolitical context was uh, changing dramatically in the 2000s. In, in, in September 11, you had, uh, you, know, I'll, I, you know, you had septem September 11 here in the US. You had uh, the, 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 the rise of terrorism on the international scene. You had uh, Afghanistan, you had Iraq. So how did this very uh, dramatically changing international context influence uh, your handling of the demands of, of peacekeeping? Well, uh, you see, I think there you have to, the two different sets of situations. In those places where uh, the ex extremism of um, uh, Al-Qaeda and uh, related movements uh, has a, an influence, it has made life for the UN very difficult because the UN is perceived as uh, a party yes. in, that, uh, in that conflict. So, When the UN uh, operates in Iraq, we had the tragedy of uh, when Sergio de Mello and uh, so many friends who died in Baghdad. Uh, we have seen uh, people killed in Afghanistan. 
uh, in uh, that part of the world, uh, it has made the work of the UN very, very difficult. Uh, in uh, Africa, I think uh, that it has been less uh, of, a, of a problem and that, in a way, uh, even uh, in the Bush administration, where I mean, there were some members of the Bush administration who were not at all uh, uh, supportive of pro the UN, UN yeah. pro UN, uh, but there was among, including senior officials of the Bush administration, there was a recognition that, well, the U.S. was uh, very much, I mean, uh, stretched with the, I mean, its engagement in Iraq and then Afga and Afghanistan, especially Iraq at the time of the Bush administration, uh, and so that the UN, in all those uh, places. Uh, which are not strategic interest uh, for the Western powers, it's good to have the UN. Yes. And so, I, in that sense, I didn't, I didn't feel that uh, there was a lack of support uh, for peacekeeping. I felt that, in a way, there was a recognition that peacekeeping was, was, a, uh, uh, was quite useful, uh, actually. The... Um, the difficulty, though, was that in the Security Council, with the very acrimonious uh, mood that uh, developed uh, uh, after, I mean, the, during the, at the time of the Iraq War, there was a risk that this could comp complicate uh, negotiations and uh, agreement on missions. But in the case of Congo, for instance, and the, um, the operation in Bunia, uh, in Ituri, happened. Uh, uh, in the summer of 2003, so right after the Iraq war. It's actually quite interesting that in a way this operation, uh, I don't know if I can say benefited uh, from the Iraq war, but it it, there was a sense in the council after the, the horrible uh, disputes in the council on the Iraq war that it was important for the council to show that they could come together. Yes. Mm -hmm. And actually I used that to get the support in the in the council. And I think the, the members of the council, the US, France, uh, which had been bitter opponents on the Iraq war, were happy to come together on uh, Congo. Uh, and the US helped and the French worked with the US. Uh, so it's, it's a complicated picture, the relationship between I mean, the sort of geostrategic issues yes. Uh, and peacekeeping. But, but uh, it, it seems that uh, your involvement or the involvement of the UN uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq was not as important as, uh, as time consuming as it was for you for Congo. I mean, uh, uh, the UN didn't have the lead in this uh, crisis. Well, and, uh, in Iraq, I was not uh, involved because there, was no, there were no peacekeepers and the mission was uh, run by the Department of Political Affairs. Okay. So, I mean, I had. Uh, I mean, uh, the Secretary General I mean, consulted his uh, senior advisors, so I would discuss uh, Iraq in meetings or uh, in tete a tete with Secretary General a number of times, but I had no operational responsibility. In the case of Afghanistan, it was different because uh, Secretary General made the decision that the uh, Department of Peacekeeping would be responsible yes. uh, for the mission in Afghanistan. But I mean, we had the privilege of having an outstanding uh, special representative like Dar Brahimi. Yes. Uh, and so I tried to help him, but I certainly didn't claim I was going to second guess uh, what he was doing so in, he in Kabul. He took the lead, yes. yes, yes, yes. And so f throughout all these years, you know, uh, while uh, trying to manage all these crises, you were also trying to, to strengthen and reform uh, peacekeeping. So the, all the, the, the reform work that you, did, uh, throughout the, that you did throughout the 2000s, was it simply uh, about implementing precisely this Brahimi report, or was it also going beyond this? Well, in some, uh, in some areas we went uh, way beyond. Uh, for instance, when you think now that there is an Office of Rule of Law and Security Institutions, it goes way beyond what was envisaged in the Brahimi report, which we just said you have to separate the police from the military. Yes. Uh, and so we, we said, no, you need to not only, I mean, yes, have a standalone police capacity, but you need to uh, connect that to an effort uh, with the judiciary, an effort with corrections. Uh, that was 
much a much uh, bigger ambition that what was uh, that what had been envisaged mm -hmm. in, in the in the Brahimi, uh, in so Brahimi the, report. So the rule of law dimension was an important part of this new agenda. Yes, well, it came gradually, but uh, it was an important part of the agenda. Another another important part was turning. Uh, it, turning the UN more in a learning organization, having a, uh, you know, a continuous cycle between analysis of best practice, having after action reports, looking at how things have been done, drawing the conclusion, and then turning that into action directives, yes. broad directive procedures, uh, and, and then uh, training, uh, so that, so, and integrating uh, all, all of that. So there, there were hundreds of different uh, efforts that were made so that the UN in peacekeeping would not have uh, to reinvent the wheel at every turn of the road, but rather would have a body of procedures, of doctrine. I pushed a lot for a capstone doctrine, which was the first time ever that there was in writing uh, a document. Uh, that became a. That was not. We didn't want that document to be a formal document because then you would. It would have probably been so watered down by negotiation yes. uh, that it would not have been that useful. But that it would gradually acquire the status of an mm -hmm. authoritative uh, document. Mm -hmm. What was also important, I think, was for you to to streamline uh, careers in the context of, of peacekeeping operations between UN headquarters and the field. I mean, strengthen the human capacity uh, or the human resources capacity of the department. Yes, I mean, at the end of the day, all these operations they are built on the quality of the people. Yes, uh, and so there were some significant restructuring in uh, the Department of Peacekeeping Operations, eventually amplified by, I mean, uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon when uh, the operation had grown so much that it was turned into two departments, but with strong connections between the, the, the two departments. One big part of the effort was to attract uh, an outstanding team. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I was very lucky to, to have a number of very good uh, people. I mean, in peacekeeping, like in any uh, major enterprise, you have, I mean, not every, I mean, not everybody is outstanding, but I must say uh, that there were quite a few uh, remarkable, and this uh, really uh, created, uh, I think, the right dynamics to to make progress. No, because it's, it's you know, make a career out of peacekeeping in the UN context is not an easy thing, because you know you 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 serve around the world in difficult situations. So how do you somehow? Uh, optimize f for the organization and for the people, I mean for the UN staff, this kind of difficult environment. I yeah. think you, you cared for this thing, for you, for you it was very important. Very important. Um, well I think there's still a lot that needs to change to be honest and that's why I, mean, I, uh, I recently uh, chaired um, in, uh, an advisory uh, uh, group uh, to, to offer some recommendations yes. on Syrian capacities. But I think it's, a, it's an area in which the UN still has a lot of, uh, of progress uh, to, to make. Uh, I'm not sure that it makes sense to have a whole career in peacekeeping because uh, you, you, by definition, peacekeeping operations are deployed in countries in crisis. Yes. And uh, you don't want to spend all your life in crisis places. Sometimes it's good to be in a place that is just normal. Maybe it helps you bring normality to places that have lost that normality. Yes. So I think ideally you would want the careers to allow people to move back and forth between mm -hmm. headquarters and the field, but also between uh, field position in crisis places and field position in more settled yes. places. And then there are, there, there are all sorts of technical issues. Uh, you need to harmonize uh, status. I think you need also, uh, frankly, in peacekeeping to be less stringent on the so-called notion of non-family missions. Yes. I think there are lots of places where you could have families with some precautions, but uh, there could be adjustment. I think we, we, go, we go too far there. Turning now to the, to the future, uh, and as a way to, to, uh, to, to end our conversation, how did you see the, 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 the situation evolving for, for UN peacekeeping uh, in, in the years ahead? I mean, uh, what do you see? You don't have a crystal ball, but I mean, what are the trends? Uh, which you think we should keep in mind? Well, you see, I think the, the big 
unresolved question is what kind of peace are we trying to promote? I think in the international community we agree of, on what we don't want. We don't want chaos, we don't want war, we don't want violence. Uh, there is a broad agreement in the Security Council and in the International Committee on, on that, mm -hmm. thank God. <laughs> yes. uh, but what do we call peace? What do we call stability? Uh, the definition of peace and stability uh, is not the same, I would say, in Washington, in Beijing, in New Delhi, uh, uh, in Brasilia, uh, and it needs to, there needs to be more, more common ground. So, so regarding the, the, the future of peacekeeping, uh, your feeling is that we should have a greater specification of what, mean, of what we mean by peace? Yes. You feel that we are... We have to agree, I mean, we will never agree on all the details, but we have to have a measure of um, sort of common vision of where we want to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and I take the example of Congo. We've discussed Congo a lot uh, in, that conversa in, our, in our conversation. You see, uh, Congo now, there are um, China, new investors. China has invested some $9 billion dollars in the country. Uh, so China, Chinese companies have a stake in the stability of the country, just as Western countries, Western companies. Now, do they have the same definition of stability? What's the role of institutions? Uh, how are you going to channel conflicts through institutions? Uh, what kind of institutions should we push? Uh, do we have a common understanding that we can promote with the Congolese on that? I don't think we have enough of that conversation. It's a very sensitive, very delicate uh, conversation. Uh, but when you invest so much money, I'm not talking just of the investment of the companies, but the investment of the UN, yes. which has spent billion Uh, in Congo, uh, there has to be a measure of clarity. And, and why is it that we are not having this uh, conversation or, or, on what do we mean by peace? And why is it that we don't have this clarity? Because uh, we are competitors. I mean, the, the international community, it's a beautiful word, I mean, beautiful expression, these two words, international community. Community is a very strong word. But is there an international community? community in the real meaning of the word. Is there a common vision of some basic uh, principle? Uh, it's, not, it's not absolutely clear. It's, so, uns uh, it's uncertain. So uh, at the time we're working together, we're undermining one another well, to a certain extent? To a certain extent. That is, I, I think there has to be a much greater effort to to try in the Security Council, among the key players uh, in the so-called International Community, to, have a, uh, to reach a common understanding on the fundamental goals of peacekeeping. You know, between, I would say, the maximalist democratization agenda mm -hmm. of Western countries and a, a more minimalist agenda, just stabilization, uh, Uh, but what does stabilization mean of um, in the non-aligned movement of countries uh, like China? We, we have to find uh, the, the right balance, balance yes. And uh, I don't think we are, we are there yet. And for an enterprise as ambitious as peacekeeping has become, it's very important, so to speak, that the board of directors <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, be agreed. If the board of directors that the Security Council is uh, is not totally uh, clear on where it wants to go, then all these difficult missions are at risk. And, and can the head of UN Peace Operations uh, help uh, the board of directors to see the light, so to speak? Yes. And, and, and if it is the case, how do you go about this? Well, uh, you go back to the prescription of the Brahimi report. Tell the council what it needs to know, not what it wants to hear. That is, you have to make uh, a good analysis of the situations you're confronted with. You have to be clear with the council on what are the underlying issues. You should not paper them over. The, that's, but that's hard to really make a good analysis. And then what is even harder is to define, to be totally clear on what needs to be done. Because frankly, uh, I think there is a 
a sort of conceptual deficit. Uh, I think, again, we know what we don't want, but we're not so it's sure, not, not only of the goals, but how to reach uh, those goals. It's enormously uh, complicated. How ambitious should we be? Not just for reasons of political consensus, but for reasons of practicality. What can we realistically achieve uh, in, a, in a country, because if we, if we are overambitious, not only will we go beyond the international com consensus, but we will also create a backlash uh, among the people that we claim to help. So finding that balance between ambition and humility, keeping the respect, that is enormously hard. and. Uh, Today, frankly, I, I don't think that there is a, a clear sense of what are the A, B, C, D uh, oh, that right. you need uh, of stabilization of a peace operation. There, are, there is a better understanding today than 10 years ago of, a number of, th of what not to do, of a number of issues that are important that you should not ig ignore. Security sector reform is, is one of them. Uh, but a clear sense on how you, you proceed no. And frankly, each situation also is specific. And so you, there's never going to be a manual that tells you uh, this is, uh, these are the 10 steps that you need to, to make. So what are the areas uh, in which or on which you feel there is a strategic need for clarity? And what could be the tools, I mean, within the UN, for instance, uh, which would allow us to, to acquire this kind of analytical and conceptual clarity? which is key for then being able mm. to deliver practical success, right? Well, I think, frankly, I mean, now I uh, work in a university at Columbia University, I think, frankly, there has to be much more independent research on uh, how societies function, and the interaction between the modern st the structures of a modern state and the traditional structures, mm -hmm. how they interact, uh, how you manage their interface, uh, there has to be much more thorough studies on the impact of elections. What's the place of elections in a peace process? We tend to have a kind of magical view of uh, elections. Yes. That's very dangerous because elections are in any society a very divisive moment. Uh, and so if you haven't built the right context around the elections, the election can just be the trigger uh, of more of more violence, so we haven't thought through really uh, the role of election in a peace process. The sequence of election, we ta we tend to put priority on uh, the, uh, the election of the executive of the president, uh, because we want to appoint executives so that we don't have to think of that country anymore. But the the much more complex issue of the balance between the different centers of power, yes. the sub-layers, the parliament, the local institutions, we tend to ignore the chain of accountability uh, in the state, uh, how you build it, uh, all that we, uh, we, have, uh, we don't have enough knowledge. Rule of law, you know, there have been works, Tom Carothers and others, who, who have pointed to all the difficulties of just a mechanical view of, uh, of rule of law, because the law the rule of law, each country has its own culture. Law is a reflection of the political dynamics of a country. So there again, you can't have a sort of mechanic, mechanistic uh, approach. Uh, you, and on all that, I think uh, a more thorough st I mean, reflection, knowledge, I mean, uh, research on peace processes, on elections, on, security, on successful and unsuccessful uh, uh, security sector efforts, on, on successful and unsuccessful reintegration efforts. How do you move a combat combatant from his position of combatant to being a person without a gun in a, a peaceful society? All that, frankly, we, we, today we identify more the problems, but we don't have a clear sense yet of what are the right answers. So, so we are lacking knowledge when it comes to the places uh, in which we get involved. I mean, we, we in fact uh, know very little about Africa, for instance, and we don't know much about uh, the effectiveness of our uh, tools. So, so what would be the, the right place for this knowledge to be generated and nurtured? Should it happen 
in, in, uh, in, in given places within the UN system? Should it happen in universities? I mean, what would be the right places? Uh, I think it has, I mean, it has to happen in an interaction between UN system and, indep and completely independent uh, academic institutions. But academic institutions, which are well plugged in, yes, because uh, often because the, uh, otherwise it will be uh, work that debates, has no absolutely. that has no relevance uh, yes. for the practitioners, yes. and it's, that's what's difficult. Is you have to get the right the balance right between being grounded in real experience and at the same time being really independent. So you have no bureaucratic agenda, mm -hmm. no na national agenda that sort of distorts. But there are very uh, your, your few research. places like this. Very few, not very enough. Few. Yeah. And perhaps none, actually. Well, you, you have here and there independent, yes. some, uh, some good research that is being done, but uh, not enough. You see, there is a conceptual, uh, there's a conceptual deficit, there is a political uh, deficit, and there is a resource deficit. Mm -hmm. uh, we tend to focus on the resource deficit. Uh, get the right people, mobilize them, and that's uh, one of the mm, efforts I mean, in the... Uh, in the report I just uh, uh, s submitted to the Secretary General on Syrian capacities. The resource deficit is very important, how to mobilize the right, the right capacity. But I would say the uh, conceptual the deficit. deficit is almost as important because we have to, to have a better sense of what we need to do. And then there is, last but not least, there is the political deficit that is these questions of states that are in dire need of help, of external help, are we serious about helping them or not? Do we consider that as a major strategic issue? Do we consider that as a, do we consider helping them as a ethical issue? Or do we not really uh, care? Care, yes. And I think there is nothing more dangerous than a half-hearted engagement or an engagement that is not willing to stay the course because there is no question that when you move into a country it has an enormous impact. But then if you suddenly get tired and just abandon mm -hmm. it, then you, you, you have created hopes, you have uh, profoundly uh, shaken uh, the society. The society. And then you leave it to its own device, and that's irresponsible. And, and so precisely, so you, you give us these three choices. Uh, um, we don't care. We approach these matters uh, through uh, uh, con ethical considerations, and then we see it as strategic. So if you had to assess uh, the way the so-called international community is addressing all of this uh, crisis, what would be... Uh, the, 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 the angle uh, which you think is the, the, the one which fits the most uh, the reality of uh, the international community engagement? Is it ethical consideration? Is it strategic consideration? Or is it a mix of, of everything? Uh, it's, probably, it's probably a mix. I think one has to be clear that the notion that the, the world can be happy in the face of immense misery uh, it's just... Uh, uh, not acceptable. Uh, and I think most people are decent human beings and they don't want that. But I think that's not enough. I think you have to emphasize the, uh, the strategic uh, d dimension. That is, if you accept uh, that states can almost collapse, uh, that they can, for all practical matter, be abandoned, uh, then uh, gradually the, uh, the ungoverned space, uh, so to speak, uh, will uh, grow and grow and grow. Uh, and that's, that's enormously uh, dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, so we because cannot not intervene? The no, no, we cannot not intervene, because the notion that you can just, uh, you know, uh, put more uh, customs officers, more uh, security people at the border, and you will live in a fortress surrounded by misery mm -hmm. uh, in a globalized world where people move around uh, very easily, uh, that is an illusion. And so you're not going to have bubbles of peace and prosperity if you have uh, areas of uh, chaos and uh, misery expanding. Uh, you need uh, the states as the kind of first response custodians 
benevolent mm -hmm. custodians of the people. So I think the, the ethical imperative and the strategic imperative come together, actually. Uh, you, you are talking about uh, ethical considerations, uh, strategic considerations. We haven't uh, uh, talked about Haiti, which is very close from here, and, and the UN has been involved in Haiti uh, uh, all the way since uh, 1994. What is your assessment of the UN involvement uh, uh, in Haiti, because it continues to be part of the UN agenda? Indeed. Well, you know, Haiti is a real tragedy because before the earthquake struck, I think Haiti had made, uh, with the um, and, uh, latest involvement of the UN, had made real, quite significant uh, progress. Uh, the, uh, the violence had been contained uh, and there was real prospects of more investments, more, I mean, uh, the transformation of the political culture. Uh, in Haiti, uh, of course, the the enormous tragedy of the uh, of the earthquake uh, brought all of us back to uh, square square one in in a in a tragic way. I think in Haiti, uh, the pr one of the the fundamental issue is a political is a political one. Uh, people think, oh, let's just, just, just uh, throw money, have development projects. No. It's not going to be enough. It's not going to be enough. It's the, the, the political software, so to speak, that has to, be, uh, uh, that has to evolve. In Haiti, there is an enormous, I would say, social question. You have a, a very small number of people who have enormous wealth, and you have uh, many people who have immense poverty. And so it's an enormously polarized uh, society uh, where it's not clear that there is a, uh, that those in power, that there is enough of a constituency for change uh, in a way that would benefit all, but, all but the people. It's, it must be in these conditions, it must be very difficult for the UN to, to really succeed and make a difference. I mean, we make a difference, but it's to it's on uh, it's enormously difficult. I think the focus has to be politics, politics, mm -hmm. and politics uh, mm -hmm. in Haiti. So uh, and so, perhaps as a way to, to 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 finish our conversation, back to the future. So in, in in ten years from now, twenty years from now, where do you see the the, the UN? I mean, uh, uh, the UN peacekeeping operations. What will be uh, at the center of uh, the conversation uh, concerning peacekeeping operations? Well, you know, if uh, I would like to be a great optimist, I would say, I would hope that in 20 years from now, the issue of fragile states, of uh, fragile communities would have been I mean, uh, resolved. Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure it will be. But I think the, uh, the form of violence is changing, that more and more you have, uh, for instance, mega cities uh, where the uh, sort of the, the social, social control, control of the state is weaker and where there is not uh, the, the social capi capital, so to speak, is very depleted. And that's a phenomenon that you see in the developing world with these mega cities of Mexico, Kinshasa, Lagos, Cairo, mm -hmm. um, and all around them, I and mean, Karachi, I mean, to, to mention uh, three different uh, continents. Uh, but uh, it's also something that may affect our own uh, world. You have seen the violence in uh, French uh, suburbs. Yes, so you urban seen, violence. I think urban violence, I think the uh, the management, the political management of urban spaces will be, is an issue you think, of the future. You think that it could become part of the UN uh, peacekeeping agenda? I, uh, you asked me a very difficult question, where will we be? No, but you're right. I mean, but I think uh, it's quite the yeah. possibility, yes. yes. Because more and more you will have uh, also transnational threats that then are rooted in very local uh, problems mm -hmm. and uh, issues like uh, the drug uh, traffic 
Uh, it may be resolved if the status of drugs uh, changes as rec recommended by a recent uh, report, but it may not. Uh, and uh, you see there that often uh, states do not have the capacity to deal on their own. Yeah, in the case of Mexico, yes. uh, which is a real problem. Yes, or West Africa. Or West Africa. We West Africa, which now uh, so, I mean, really suffers from I mean, a lot of drugs from Latin America mm -hmm. go to Europe through West Africa. So, so uh, years ago, uh, peacekeeping operation was about uh, inter interstate violence. It, 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 it became about interstate or inner country violence. And, and so you're telling us that the, 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 the possible evolution of the nature of violence could lead to a, a third, perhaps, uh, well, you know, it reflects, uh, I mean, uh, my own view of the evolution of the world is that it's going to become uh, ever more global and ever more local. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and that the intermediate structures are being weakened by those two trends. Uh, the, the people are more and more affected by global issues, uh, global movement of people, global epidemics, global climate change, etc. Uh, but at the same time, because they lack, uh, they have less and less confidence in distant structures, so they okay. sort of, uh, uh, they more and more they focus. They relocalize themselves. They relocalize themselves, exactly. Uh, and so this will create a lot of new uh, political issues, but you need, uh, you need some mortar to connect all these uh, local uh, and global uh, issues. Uh, and uh, I think probably the UN may have a role there. Of course, the UN is an organization of states, of sovereign states. That's, uh, these are, the states are the building blocks uh, of the UN. And the states are in crisis. Yes. Uh, and so how will that crisis affect uh, the UN, how the UN will be part of the solution uh, of that crisis, I think that's, that's a real strategic uh, issue uh, for the UN. What I'm sure of is that today there is a certain fashion for going beyond institutions. But that's, a, but that's a luxury that only the rich can afford. When you are poor, when you are weak, you want the reassurance of the law, of the formal processes. And so I think this invention of institutions that goes back to <laughs> the ancient Greeks or before, <laughs> uh, that, that is not going to uh, just uh, go by the wayside. Uh, but institutions will have to, to adapt to a different way of connecting the local uh, to the global. The mediation of states, all that is under, under threat. What will uh, complement or replace it? Uh, I don't know. I think more thought has to be given to that. But the UN, as an organization of states, will have to reflect that evolution. And, and, and peacekeeping and collective security could be part of this of evolving picture. Yes, what's remarkable with peacekeeping is being a re very resilient activity. So peacekeeping is always a reflection of the international system. When the international system was defined by the Cold War, peacekeeping was that activity that prevented local conflicts from escalating to the central conflict. So it, it kept the peace, so to speak, on the margins of the central east-west uh, conflict. Once the polarizing magnets of the Cold War had been uh, removed, uh, then peacekeeping was used to try to shore up states as they remain the building blocks of the international system. As we evolve toward a new type of international system, peacekeeping will, uh, change, again. will change again.